Hello, BookTube. It's Tuesday, a bright, sunny, warm Tuesday here in Boston, and that's Tag Tuesday. And we're barreling right along today with the alphabet tags that are being created by Jim at Jim's Books and Reading and Stuff. Uh, we're all the way up to the J tag, uh, which is the tag for his channel, Jim's Books, Reading and Stuff. Uh, and we're just going to go straight to the prompts here, and prompt number one is J is for Japan. What is the last book you read by a Japanese author? And I actually know this because I read it last night. It's Clark and Division by Naomi Hirahara. Uh, uh, very lightly fictionalized, I would imagine, account of her own ancestors in uh, trying to reintegrate into American society after uh, her Japanese ancestors trying to reintegrate into American society after being locked in concentration camps during World War II by uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, there were very effective moments in Clark and Division. It's a it's a wooden thing. It's an over earnest thing. It's an, it's a novel that clearly does not intend to be evaluated as a novel. And I would be willing to bet that it w in when the author does speaking engagements, if speaking engagements still happen post COVID or or in the middle of COVID, I would be willing to bet that when the author does speaking engagements or uh, Zoom interviews or whatnot about this book, she literally never mentions the fact that it's fiction. Uh, but one way or another, I thought parts of it were good. Uh, that That is certainly the last uh, novel by a Japanese author that I've read. Uh, then J is for Jamaica. Uh, what is the last book you read by an author from the Caribbean? Uh, and that would be Monster in the Middle by Tiffany Yannick, uh, who is... Uh, very talented, and this book is, I thought it was terrific, uh, just terrific. I think it probably has, uh, likewise, heaping helpings of the author's own uh, autobiography, of the author's own grandparents and their grandparents' generation. But uh, if that's true, or whether or not that's true, it's certainly the same kind of book as Clark and Division, but executed much better. So... Uh, that that would be the last one. I don't remember exactly where Tiffany Yannick is from, but uh, but I know that she's from somewhere in the Caribbean. I don't really check these things. <laughs> I know that puts me alone on an island in the 21st century when not only does everyone, every other reader, check things like country of origin, sexual preference, exact gradation of skin color, uh, the last 10 years on Twitter. Uh, not only in the 21st century does every single person who calls himself a reader check all those things before they read an author, but I would say 85% of them check all those things instead of reading the author. And I don't care about any of those things at all. So, But nevertheless, that is the la that book comes out, I think, in the autumn. Uh, then J is for Jane Austen. You knew she was going to come up on this tag. Uh, and also the month of July. Uh, what are you reading for Jane Austen July, which is a, a heralded booktube event that's going on right now, a celebration of Jane Austen. Uh, if you are late to the party, what did you read for Jane Austen July 2021? Uh, I am, I got all excited about Jane Austen July in late June and thought that I would read Pride and Prejudice again. No particular justification possible for that, since I've read Pride and Prejudice so many times that I I know large chunks of it by heart, but uh, I thought I'll read that for Jane Austen July, and I took a copy. I have a little a little uh, trade paperback that I rather like, a cheap little Wordsworth trade paperback that I rather like. I took it down off the shelf and thought, okay, well you'll read that for Jane Austen July, and then I started reading that little trade paperback and thought, you know what I really feel like doing? I feel like reading this in the big Penguin Classic deluxe edition of all of Jane Austen. So I put the little trade paperback back, and I took that that wonderful trade paperback down off the shelf, uh, and read all of Pride and Prejudice <laughs> before not only before July, but before that evening was out. <laughs> so instead, I have decided on Mansfield Park, and I'm intentionally holding off so that I can have a little bit of a feel of Jane Austen in Jane Austen July <laughs> instead of doing it right before or gulping it down in an hour or right during. Uh, and then J is for James Joyce. We go from the sublime to the ridiculous. What is your favorite novel by James Joyce? Have you been brave enough to tackle Finnegan's Wake? Uh, I have tackled Finnegan's Wake. I'm not sure that I agree that it requires bravery. In fact, I don't think it does. It requires a certain amount of bravery to just brazenly waste that much of your life when you, you only have one life and it's fading right before your eyes. But nevertheless... Uh, I, I have read everything by James Joyce, and I've also read everything by all of the Irish authors of his generation and all the postmodern authors of his generation. And he's the worst of both bunches. He's wretched. 
there's virtually nothing that he wrote that's any good. And Finnegan's Wake tops even Ulysses as just a gigantic quivering mountain of poo. Uh, so, so I have had, I, I don't know that I've, that I've been brave enough to tackle Finnegan's Wake, but I have tackled it twice. And it's worthless. It's, it is the uh, pre-millennial incarnation of Infinite Jest. It is just the author trying to wear down the reader without having anything valuable to say in the meantime. I mean, you could say there's an argument to be made, maybe, that, uh, for instance, Joseph and His Brothers by Thomas Mann is an attempt by the author to wear down the reader, but you get something out of it, whether it, whether it is or not. And with Joyce, you don't get anything out of anything. <laughs> so so, uh, so the, the J is for James and Joyce and just out of luck. <laughs> uh, uh, then J is for joke. Tell us a bookish joke. I am notorious for being bad at telling jokes. I don't know. I know there's no genetic component to this, but uh, me say me say Ma was also really bad at telling jokes. Actually, telling jokes. I mean, a set, prearranged, memorized joke. She was terrible at telling them. Timing all wrong, pacing all wrong, or ordinarily tipping off the punchline ahead of time and then backtracking. Just every stereotypical mistake you could think of in someone telling a pre-planned joke. And I don't think, I don't know whether it's genetic or not, but I'm terrible at it too. I have very little in the way of a mental store of memorized jokes for all occasions, almost none. I, I know in, in my head probably only about 30 jokes, and they're all Jewish jokes. <laughs> they were all told to me by a very old and very wonderful member of the chosen people who thought that Jewish jokes were just about the funniest things in the world, and I agree. I agree. Uh, but I don't have the panache for telling them at all. Uh, and I, the only, the only special consideration that I want to maybe partially claim for myself is the same one actually that I would claim for me sainted Mao. Uh, so if there's a genetic component, I might benefit as well as as suffer from it, because I think there are two kinds of humor, right? One is you know a whole bunch of jokes, you you know a whole bunch of puns, wordplay, knock knock jokes, that sort of thing, and the other is situational comedy where you can just be funny in conversation, where you can, you can without prompting and without memorization, your, your outlook on the world can be found funny by other people. I, I say that Miss Sainted Ma had no idea how to tell a joke. She didn't. She didn't have any idea how to tell a joke. But I don't think I have ever remember a conversation with her that anyone's ever had where they didn't end up laughing. Uh, and I think I provoke something like the same reaction myself. I think, in other words, that if I learn anything from her, it's, it's to be a humorous person, which maybe is different from someone who has memorized lots of jokes. Uh, but I, 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 it, it, one way or another, I don't, I don't have any bookish jokes, and the only jokes that I do have are a small repertoire of Jewish jokes that I'm fairly certain, given the nature of the 21st century, I'm fairly certain that even a Jewish person is not allowed to tell Jewish jokes anymore. It's utterly ridiculous. I, I, uh, Jews have been embracing Jewish jokes for 200 years. They, they love them more than anything. <laughs> they love them more than the, than the Gentiles do, and for good reason, because they're so good. But I'm not sure that I wouldn't get canceled if I told a, Jew, a Jewish joke on this channel. I know quite a few good ones, but I'm going to have to pass. Certainly, because I, on the strict heading of the of the prompt, I don't know any any bookish jokes. I know some bookish plays on words that people think are funny that I just hate. I just absolutely hate them. Uh, so I'm going to let it go. I'm going to let this one go. I'm going to I'm going to trust to the good graces of the judgment of anyone who has watched this channel to maybe give me a little grace to maybe allow for the fact, having watched this channel that there maybe is a difference between someone who mechanically memorizes jokes and somebody who is funny, who is a humorous person. I would like to think that I am a humorous person, but I, I don't have a store of jokes. Uh, then J is for Jaguar. Uh, Enzo Ferrari described the Jaguar E-Type XKE as the most beautiful car in the world. What do you consider the most beautiful car in the world? Uh... <laughs> This is a, a prompt that goes right by my, right by me like a ghost ship in the night. I not only don't think that any cars are beautiful. I'm not only 
not on the wavelength of seeing aesthetics in such things at all. But I can't even tell the difference between two different cars. Literally can't tell the difference between them. Maybe if it's exaggerated. I mean, if, if a car is, you know, gigantic or bright red or something like that, then maybe I'll, you'll, if you're saying, hey, look at that car, I might be able to know what you mean. I might be able to pick out which, which one in a row you're talking about without you elaborating any further. But most of the time, when I'm a passenger in somebody else's car, and they say, hey, wow, look at that car, I have no idea what they're pointing at because I don't know anything about cars, and I don't think, I don't perceive any aesthetics in them at all. <laughs> which is certainly going to put me on a different wavelength than this particular prompt, and probably a different wavelength than all the rest of you. Uh, for Certainly from uh, a slightly a slightly picky, slightly uh, 21st century way of looking at things, I would say that the most beautiful car that I could imagine seeing would be a car in a museum commemorating when people used to use them. Uh, cars hit people by the hundreds of thousands every year. Cars destroy the environment. Cars destroy the charm of distance. They destroy the charm of intimacy. I, I would I would rather either that they be all electronic or or uh, um, any other, I mean, solar powered or whatever. I'd rather either that they be that or that they mostly be for emergencies and that the, most of us get around the rest of the time some other way. Uh, I guess that won't work in most, like, for instance, most of my country, most of the United States, uh, even though most people live in or in the, the immediate orbit of large cities, millions and millions of people do not. I think, for instance, of Iowa, uh, the, the great Midwestern state of Iowa, where if you didn't have a car of some kind, if, you, if for instance, you rode a bike, uh, you'd be, hardly be able to go anywhere. You, the whole state is set up for cars. I think, for instance, of when I when Frida and I were last up in Vermont. Uh, it's a it's a tiny, narrow state, but nevertheless, if you don't have a car, there's there's virtually nothing that you can do unless you're near one of those cities. Uh, whereas, for instance, here uh, in my immediate area, uh, most people I would say use cars that don't need them. That, and hence the Boston's program, Boston has a program where they, they have these huge banks of uh, city-owned bikes that you can, you can swipe a credit card and rent the bike and you, you take it from that one bank and you drive it to your location, which you're hoping will be in the vicinity of another bank and that's where you log it in. Uh, and apparently the program is somewhat successful. When I saw the, the banks being installed all over Boston, I was extremely skeptical. I thought, you know, is there a hue and cry for this? Or are you trying to, to shape the ha new habits in uh, a city that really resists new habits? Uh, but I can't argue with my own senses, despite the fact that arguing with your own senses, that not believing what you see and hear with your own senses directly is, in fact, the uh, required fad of the 21st century. Despite the fact that that is true, I can't argue with my own senses. One of those bike banks is in my immediate area. I saw it being put in. I thought, oh, come on. This is a bit of an eyesore, and these things aren't going to be used. And the, the ranks of those bikes empty every day and fill back up again every night. So they are being used. And if that's true here, I can only assume it's true in downtown Boston. I think the, the goal with these things was probably to encourage people to think, well, okay, do I need a car? I mean, if I'm taking the commuter train from my suburb to work in Boston, let's say pre-COVID, I'm taking the commuter train to work in Boston, and then I have errands to run. I work maybe, you know, from 8 to 3, and then from 3 to 5, I have errands to run. Do I really need a car where I'm going to spend half of that time hunting for a parking space? Or can I just leave the car at home and use one of these city bikes? So not only am I leaving the car at home, but I'm also freeing myself from the headache of trying to bring my own bike on the, the commuter train, which is technically possible. I've done it many, many times, but uh, it's not convenient at all. And there's also the, the risk of theft. And if you have, if you have these banks of city-owned bikes, none of that's a problem. It's, just, it's a nominal fee for you to use the thing as long as you want. Uh, I'm wondering if maybe these programs have encouraged lots of people in, who ha are in that situation, which is a lot of people. Boston's population, the, the population of 
the greater downtown Boston area, swells by a million and a half people in the middle of a workday, again, pre-COVID. What if half that million and a half people are suddenly realizing, you know, I don't need to bring my car into the city at all. I could take the commuter rail, it's much cheaper, and then I can just use a bike when I'm in town. If I got an appointment across town, I can just rent a bike and then ride on, on carefully demarcated and relatively safe bike lanes. Uh, you, I have to wonder, if half of that million and a half people think that way and then try it, what number out of that 75 you know, million people will say, okay, well, I don't need a car to come into the city. And if I don't need a car to come into the city, do I really need a car at all? Maybe I don't. Maybe even in my suburban town, I don't need a car. Maybe I need a bike there as well. Maybe, in other words, I can rent a car for the extremely rare circumstance in which I legitimately need one, and that otherwise, no. Uh, one way or another, <laughs> cars, I think, are really bad for the, for the world, but nevertheless, uh, I, whether they're ever going to end up in museums or not, I don't have any idea what a Ferrari is. I have no idea what any of these things look like, and I have no ability to perceive their aesthetics, even if I did. <laughs> so, so we end on a dud. We end on a dud of a question. <laughs> but there's the K tag uh, next week. <laughs> and K has lots of fruitful possibilities. So that is the J tag. All it's have to do is tag people. I don't know who to tag. I will tag any of you, especially all of you who are doing the alphabet tags. If you haven't caught up, put the J tag on your list. <laughs> uh, and I will, I will wrap this up for now. I will see you soon, though. Thank you, BookTube.